Right, so today we're doing lecture 14. We're looking at infectious diseases and epidemiology today. Pathology is the study of disease, and that's important in microbiology because we have several organisms that will actually cause disease. Symbiosis is organisms living together. There's different types of symbiotic relationships we can have. In mutualism, both organisms benefit. With commensalism, one benefits without significantly affecting the other. Amensalism is a symbiotic relationship where one of the symbionts is going to be harmed, while the second is neither harmed nor helped by the first. An example would be the effect of penicillin on bacteria. The penicillium mold will secrete substances that are harmful to the bacteria, but the bacteria really don't have any effect on the penicillin. Parasitism is going to be a relationship where one organism benefits and the other one is harmed. Pathogens are going to be organisms that will cause disease. Pathogenicity is the ability of a microbe to cause disease. One way we look at this is the virulence or the degree of pathogenicity. It's often expressed as the ID50, which is the infective dose for 50% of the population. So how many organisms would it take for it to cause disease in 50% of the population? Your normal flora and normal microbiota, sometimes referred to as indigenous microbiota, these are organisms that colonize the body's surface without normally causing disease. There's about 3 million bacteria per cubic centimeter on the skin. While this may sound a little disturbing, it's actually really a good thing for us. It can prevent overgrowth of harmful organisms through microbial antagonism or competitive exclusion. We can categorize the normal microbiota a few different ways. So one way is our resident microbes. These are part of the flora throughout life. They are there all the time. Transient microbes are only on the body for hours, but they may be on there for months or years before disappearing. They're temporarily not relatively permanent for that organism's life. Your flora development begins at birth when you pass through the birth canal. Your first breath, your first meal, first skin contact are all going to contribute to the types of organisms that you'll have on your body. So how do these normal flora become opportunistic pathogens? Opportunists or opportunistic pathogens don't cause disease under normal circumstances. However, if the opportunity arises, they may. One way is if there is immunosuppression. So things that can cause this, disease, malnutrition, stress, extremes of age, radiation or chemotherapy treatments for cancer, AIDS, immunosuppressive drugs for transplants, all can lead to immunosuppression. Altered flora, so your microbial flora create a microbial antagonism or competition, and changing that may allow some of them to become opportunists. One example is Candida albicans. It's present in the vagina, but not in very large levels normally. However, if some of the other normal flora gets disturbed or killed, that will allow them to take advantage of that and proliferate, causing problems. Having things get in abnormal locations. If you introduce them into a location where they're not normally present, they'll lack competition and can become problematic. Then stressful conditions. Anything that strains a person's normal metabolism or emotional state can disrupt the normal microbiota. Contamination is the presence of microbes in or on the body, where infection is when they actually overcome the body's external defenses, multiply, and then become established in the body. It's a successful invasion of the pathogen. So we have a lot of reservoirs of infection or sites where the pathogen gets maintained as a source of infection. Animal reservoirs are a big one. A lot of pathogens that will infect wild or domestic animals can actually infect humans as well. A zoonosis is a natural spread from an animal host to a human. These are really difficult to eradicate because there are extensive animal reservoirs and if we were to eliminate the animal reservoirs, it's going to cause other problems in the ecosystem. Vectors are going to be animals or arthropods that will transmit the disease from one host to another. Then we have human reservoirs. They can incubate in carriers. The person may or may not have active disease or be symptomatic, but can still pass it on to others. So the story of typhoid Mary is one where they realized you could actually have these asymptomatic carriers. It was a pretty big deal that they realized that she was asymptomatic for the disease, yet spread it on to numerous people. Non-living reservoirs, these are things like soil, water, food, especially if they're fecal contaminated.
the portal of entry is going to be how they get into the body. A lot of microbes have a preferred portal, and if they gain access through other portals, it won't necessarily cause disease. So the skin, it's a good barrier when it's intact. However, some things can enter through natural openings, hair follicles, sweat glands. Some things are going to need cuts or scrapes. Some will burrow through the skin. Others will digest the outer layers to get in. Your mucosa, these line openings to the inside of the body, places like your mouth and nose. The conjunctiva, they're warm and moist, so they're more hospitable. Things can enter the respiratory tract. They may enter the respiratory tract through the eyes or through the gastrointestinal tract. The placenta is typically an effective barrier. In about 2% of pa pregnancies, pathogens will cross the placenta and infect the embryo or fetus. Parenteral is when the pathogen gets deposited beneath the skin or mucosa. Punctures are an example of this. Cuts, bites, stabs, deep abrasions, surgeries. The punctures are especially bad because they will poke things in deeper into the tissue. Adhesion is important in infection, so things must adhere to establish a colony. Adhesion is the process that microbes use to attach themselves to cells, and they can have adhesion factors, which are specialized structures or attachment proteins like suckers and hooks in the helminths. You can have attachment discs on some of the protozoa. Ligands are things like lipoproteins and glycoproteins and viruses that enable binding to complement receptors on the host. They're called adhesins in bacteria. An organism that is avirulent is one that is harmless. It may have lost its ability to make adhesin or attachment protein or other things to leave it harmless. Biofilms occur when they interact with other microbes to form a web of bacteria and polysaccharide. One example of this is dental plaque, so you have biofilms on your teeth all the time. When we look at the nature of infectious disease, disease is injury that is significant enough to interfere with the normal functioning of the body. It's a change from a state of health. The morbidity is the presence of disease or the change from health. The mortality is the death rate. So you're looking at the ratio of deaths in the population. So if you're looking at statistics on these, morbidity tells you how many just have the disease. Mortality is how many die from the disease. Signs are objective manifestations of the disease. These can be observed or measured by others, where symptoms are subjective characteristics. These are felt by the patient alone. A syndrome is a group of symptoms or signs that collectively characterize a disease or condition. Things that are asymptomatic or subclinical may go unnoticed because they have no symptoms. Etiology is the study of a cause of disease. When we're looking at how diseases are spread, a communicable disease is one that an infected person transmits an infectious agent. Contagious diseases are very communicable, communicable and capable of spreading easily. Non-communicable diseases are not spread from one host to another. So in looking at the nature of disease, we need to go back and revisit the germ theory of disease, the idea that disease is caused by infection of pathogenic organisms. So if you remember, Koch's postulates are used to demonstrate that a microbe is pathogenic and the cause of disease. So the first of his postulates is that the pathogen is present in every case of the disease. Number two is the pathogen is isolated and then grown in a pure culture. The third is it must cause disease when you inoculate that pure culture into a healthy, susceptible host. And then that same pathogen can be re-isolated from the diseased experimental host. So these are great in theory, but there are some exceptions and difficulties with these. Some pathogens cannot be cultured in the lab. Some cause disease when it's caused by a combination of a pathogen and other sets of conditions that are present. Otherwise, they may be harmless. There's ethical considerations in applying all of these postulates that would prevent you from applying the third postulate of causing disease or in knowingly infect another human with a pathogen. In some cases, it's not possible to establish a single cause for certain diseases. Things like pneumonia and meningitis can be caused by multiple different things. And then some pathogens have been ignored for a long time, like Helicobacter pylori. We've known about the organism for a long time. We just didn't realize it had pathogenic capabilities.
Virulent factors are going to be traits that enable the microbes to enter the host, adhere to the cells, gain access to nutrients, and then escape detection or removal by the immune system. Oh, there are several of these. Extracellular enzymes are as one group that will dissolve chemicals in the body and maintain the infection. Some examples would be hyaluronidase, collagenase, coagulase, kinase. Toxins, these are chemicals that would harm tissue or trigger a host immune reaction. So these chemicals can cause damage. Toxemia is when the toxins enter the bloodstream and are carried to other sites in the body. Exotoxins destroy host cells or interfere with host metabolism. We have several types of those. Cytotoxins will kill a host cell or affect their function. Neurotoxins interfere with nerve function. Enterotoxins affect cells lining the gastrointestinal tract. So then we have membrane disrupting toxins that can disrupt plasma membranes and kill the host. There are several different types of these. Leukocytins are going to form protein channels and leukocytes and macrophages that will destroy the cells. The hemolysins, these are going to destroy red blood cell membranes. Streptolysins, these are hemolysins produced by streptococcus. We have SLO, streptolysin O that's inactivated by oxygen, and streptolysin S or SLS that is stable in oxygen. You can have super antigens. These are going to provoke very intense immune responses and release enormous amount of cytokines. This immune response can give rise to a fever, nausea, diarrhea, and shock. So one example is staphylococcal toxic shock syndrome. Then genotoxins will damage DNA. They can cause mutations, disrupt cell division. They may lead to cancer. A couple examples here include Haemophilus decreyi and Helicobacter. So antitoxins are antibodies that will bind and neutralize them. Endotoxins are going to include lipid A. It's the lipid portion of the lipopolysaccharide in the gram-negative bacteria. This can lead to chills, fever, weakness, aches, shock, death, miscarriage. It can activate clotting proteins and lead to DIC or disseminated intravascular coagulation. So how do these bacterial pathogens actually damage the host cells? One way is to use the host nutrients. The siderophores are an example here. Some pathogens are going to secrete pr proteins called siderophores that will take away iron from the transport protein in the cell by binding it even more tightly or have more receptors to bind directly to the host iron transport proteins and hemoglobin. So it will take away iron from the host cell. You can have direct damage. So here you can have where they will use the host cells nutrients, they can produce waste products that are damaging or rupture host cells. Toxins are also a primary factor contributing to pathology. They can cause fever, cardiovascular disturbances, diarrhea, shock, inhibit protein synthesis, destroy cells and blood vessels, disrupt the nervous system. There's about 200 known bacterial toxins and nearly 40 percent of those cause disease by damaging eukaryotic cell membranes. So one way they thrive in the host is resisting phagocytosis. And there are different ways that they will do this. One is by having capsules. These are composed of chemicals that are normally found in the body. So they do not stimulate a host response. They're slippery to make phagocytosis difficult. And they can slow digestion by the phagocytes. There's other antiphagocytic chemicals that will prevent the fusion of lysosomes with the phagocytic vesicles. This will allow bacteria to survive in the phagocytes. Some examples, M-protein is a protein on the cell wall and the fimbrae of Streptococcus pyogenes that resist phagocytosis. Leukocytins are going to be chemicals that will destroy phagocytic white blood cells. So there are cell wall components that will help with this. Mycolic acids are in the mycobacterium, like mycobacterium tuberculosis, that will help resist phagocytosis. The fimbrae in OPA, in Neisseria gonorrhea, this uses fimbrae in an outer membrane protein called OPA that will get the host cell to take them in and grow inside the epithelial cells and leukocytes themselves. With enzymes, we can have exoenzymes and other related substances that will digest material between the cells or digest clots. Some examples of enzymes, coagulase is a bacterial enzyme that will coagulate fibrinogen in the blood.
This is involved in the walling off process that we typically see in boils that are caused by Staphylococcus. Bacterial kinases break down fibrin and digest clots, which help to isolate infection. So this is what we would see with Streptococcus. So that will tend to not isolate itself. It will tend to spread. Hyaluronidase is going to hydrolyze hyaluronic acid. It's involved in tissue blackening of wounds when they're infected, and it can help the microbes spread. This is what's going to help with gas green pathology. Collagenase breaks down collagen and facilitates the spread of microbes as well. It's produced by several of the Clostridia. IgA proteases are going to be enzymes that will destroy IgA antibodies that protect the mucous membranes. Some pathogens will have antigenic variation where they can alter their surface antigens, so they can be changed by the time the body can surmount an immune response. And then penetration into the host cell cytoskeleton. Some microbes produce surface protein called invasins that will rearrange nearby actin filaments. This will cause membrane ruffling and a place for the microbe to sink into and then be engulfed into the host. So when we look at the disease process, there are several stages here. Predisposing factors are going to be things that make the body more susceptible to disease and may alter the course of disease. Your incubation is the time between infection and when you first start to see signs and symptoms of the disease. This will depend on the virulence, the infective dose, the site, the patient's health, and the nature of the pathogen. Your prodrome is a short time of generalized mild symptoms that precede the actual illness. You don't see this in all diseases. The illness is the most severe. Here's when the signs and symptoms are most evident. The immune system has not fully responded yet. In the decline phase here, the body is going to gradually return to normal. Here you have the maximum immune response, medical treatments, things that are attacking the pathogen. Convalescence, this is when the patient recovers from the illness. You'll have tissue repair, things like that going on. The length of this depends on the amount of damage, the site, and the nature of the pathogen. So even though the signs and symptoms are gone, the person may still be more tired and run down during the convalescence phase. Then your portals of exit. This is how the organism leaves an infected patient. They need to do this to be, to be able to infect others. So it's often similar to entry or it's done through host secretions. So modes of transmission. So here, contact is where it's spread from one host to another. So when we have direct contact, it's going to involve body contact between hosts. Person to person is going to be spread without direct physical contact between the hosts. With indirect contact, we can have things like fomites. These are inanimate objects that are used to transfer pathogens to a new host. An example of this would be toys in a daycare. So you can have a sick child in there playing with the toys. When they're done, they walk away, they leave the toys, the toys aren't cleaned. Another child comes in, plays with them, and is sick before too long. Droplets, this is going to be when you have them exit the body while exhaling, coughing, sneezing. So covering your mouth is greatly helpful with those. Vehicle transmission is when it's spread through air, water, food, or bodily fluids. Something else is carrying it. When it's airborne, it can travel over a meter in a respiratory droplet via an aerosol. Waterborne, these would be a lot of the gastrointestinal diseases. Water is often a reservoir in a vehicle for them, so things like cholera. Fecal oral, when it sheds through feces and it can enter through the mucosa or skin. A lot of times this can be also contamination on food. Foodborne, the pathogens are present on contaminated food. Bodily fluid transmission is a big one. Blood, urine, saliva, and just about any other bodily fluid can contain pathogens if it's spread to another person. Vectors, these can be animals or arthropods that would transmit a pathogen. So biological vectors these are going to be 
ones that transmit and serve as a host for multiplication of a pathogen at some stage of the life cycle. So if you look at malaria, the mosquitoes are actually going to be involved with some stage of the life cycle of the malaria parasites. They're considered a biological vector. Up here, this fly that's landing on this hamburger bun, we all know what flies like to land on in their spare time. They love to land on fecal matter. So they can go from fecal matter to hamburger bun to picnic to more fecal matter and so on. So they're considered a mechanical vector. They're not required as hosts. They just passively carry pathogens on their feet, body parts, etc. This includes flies, roaches, most insects, anything that wants to land on your food and walk on it. So classification of disease, your acute disease develops rapidly, but they tend to last a short time. Where chronic disease develops slowly, they will be more continual or have recurrent infections. And then subacute diseases will have a duration and severity between the acute and chronic. When the disease is latent, the pathogen remains inactive for a long period of time before becoming active. So the chickenpox virus can do this. It can be latent for long periods of time and then become reactivated again as shingles. When it's communicable, it comes from one infected host to another, either directly or indirectly. Your contagious ones are your communicable diseases that are transmitted easily, non-communicable communicable are going to be, come from outside the host or normal microbiota. Your EIDS, or emerging infectious diseases, these are ones that are changing. So we are seeing an increase in incidence or a potential to increase in the near future. Herd immunity is when many people in the community are immune to an organism. So with vaccination, if you have the vast majority of the community immunized, it will provide herd immunity. So it's just that the, it isn't that it makes the other people immune, it's just their likelihood of encountering the pathogen is decreased when most people are immune to it. When we look at the host involvement, when you have a local infection, microbes are limited to a relatively small area of the body. In a systemic or generalized infection, the microbes are spread throughout the body by blood or lymph. A focal infection is confined to a specific area of the body. Agents of a local infection can enter the blood or lymph and then spread to a new area and become focal. Sepsis is toxic inflammation due to the spread of microbes and their toxins. It's a very serious condition. Septicemia or blood poisoning is the systemic infection from the multiplication of pathogens in the blood. Bacteremia simply means presence of bacteria in the blood. Bacteria are not normally present in the blood of a healthy host. And then toxemia is the presence of the toxin in the blood. So your primary infection is going to be your acute infection that causes the initial illness. Secondary infections are caused by an opportunist after the primary infection weakens the body's defenses. So they probably wouldn't have been an issue except that the person was already weakened from the primary infection. And then your subclinical or inapparent infections do not cause any noticeable illness. So when we look at the pathogenicity of certain organisms, plasmids and lysogeny come into play. Plasmids can carry virulence factors such as the tetanus neurotoxin, dextrin sucrase that causes tooth decay, and the streptococcus mutans. Lysogenic conversion can also change the properties of the bacteria. It can make a bacteria pathogenic that wouldn't normally be, such as in diphtheria, it's a toxin that's carried in a phage. Shiga toxin is, botulism toxin, staphylococcal enterotoxin A, and the capsule on streptococcus pneumoniae. So the phages becoming lysogenic can actually turn a lot of bacteria into pathogens. Some of the pathogenic properties of viruses, they can evade destruction by growing in the host cell. So they can just hide in the host cell. HIV hides from the immune system, and then it will turn around and attack the immune system components itself, like your CD4 positive T cells. Some viruses enter cells because the virus can mimic useful substances. An example of this would be the rabies virus that can mimic acetylcholine, which helps it get taken into the cells. So viruses can have several different cytopathic effects. 
Your viral infection will usually kill the host cell. You may accumulate large numbers of multiplying viruses. It can alter host cell plasma membranes or inhibit DNA, RNA, or protein synthesis. So some of the things we can see as a result of viral infection, macromolecule synthesis can stop. Host cells may be forced to release lysosomes when they are not planning on it or at inappropriate times that will destroy things. You can have inclusion bodies, which are going to have granules that may include some of the viral components. Several of the cells can fuse together and form multinucleate syncytiums. It may change the host cell's function. It can induce antigenic changes and be destroyed by host cell, host immune system responses. It can induce chromosomal changes. It can transform cells into cancerous cells. And it can also trigger cells to produce alpha and beta interferons. When we look at the fungi, there's no well-defined virulence factors that are associated with them, but they can produce toxins and lead to allergic reactions. So ergot is a toxin causing hallucinations. It's actually a source of LSD that comes from fungi. Aflatoxin is going to come from a fungi on grains called Aspergillus flavus. It's mutagenic. It can lead to cancer eventually. So this can be seen on grains. Peanuts are also another place where you could find this. Then mycotoxins in mushrooms. Phylloidin and amantin are produced by the Amanita death cap mushroom. It's a neurotoxin that can be fatal. There's several other toxins in mushrooms. Pathogenic properties of the protozoa. A lot of times just their presence themselves can be a problem. Their waste products can also be problematic and cause disease. They can use antigenic variation, making it harder for the immune system to attack them. So your pathogenic properties of the helminths. These are the worms. Their presence often produces symptoms. They can be fairly large, so they can cause blockages, block lymphatic drainage. They can block the gastrointestinal system, damage cells. Just their occupying space is a problem. And then, of course, they produce waste products. Some of the algae can have pathogenic products. A few of them will produce neurotoxins, saxitoxin from the dinoflagellates. When the mollusks consume it during red tide, it's not harmful to them, but it is toxic to humans. So epidemiology is the study of where and when diseases occur. So etiology is the cause. Epidemiology is more of who gets it, when, and where, and how it's transmitted within the population. Some important statistics with this. The prevalence is the total number of new cases and existing cases in a given area or population during a given time period. Your incidence is how many cases are new in that given area or population during the time period. A disease that is endemic normally occurs at a continual, relatively stable frequency within a population or geographical area. Sporadic disease only has a few scattered cases that would occur within an area or population. An epidemic is when the disease occurs at a greater than usual frequency for an area or population. And then pandemics are going to be on the larger scale. This is going to be an epidemic that occurs simultaneously on more than one continent. So public health agencies are important in this. We've got the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta, Georgia. They're a clearinghouse for epidemiological research. The MMWR is your morbidity, morbidity and mortality weekly report. Here is where the CD reports all of the nationally notifiable diseases. The nationally notifiable diseases are ones that physicians are required by law to report the cases to the U.S. Public Health Service. There's a link here where you can go in and find these. This is the one for 2017, but you can always change the year and look at other years. And here's a list of them that you can look through at your convenience. So these do change periodically. So epidemiology as a study is the study of the dynamics of the disease in a population. Descriptive epidemiology is going to use data where you tabulate the data concerning the disease. One of the things we look at is the index case. This is going to be the first case of the disease in a given area or population. We like to try and trace it back and find out where did it come from, how did it get to an area. 
With analytical epidemiology, your investigated disease details are used to determine a probable cause, the mode of transmission, and do prevention. A lot of times it is retrospective after an outbreak has occurred. With experimental epidemiology, you're testing a hypothesis concerning a disease. You may be testing treatments or prevention techniques. So HAIs, or healthcare-acquired infections, these were formerly known as nosocomial infections. You will still see that term being used since so many people out in the field learned that term when they were in school. These are infections acquired in healthcare facilities. And this is definitely a very big concern. One of the top five causes of death in the United States are medical mistakes. And this can get lumped into that category. So exogenous HAIs or nosocomials are ones that are caused by pathogens acquired from the environment. Endogenous ones, the endogenous HAIs or nosocomials, arise from normal microbiota within the patient because of factors within the healthcare setting. So these are opportunists. Iatrogenic conditions are ones that are the direct result of medical procedures, things like catheters, surgery, invasive diagnostic procedures. And then when we have super infection, this is from the use of antimicrobials that will inhibit some of the microbes and allow others to thrive. So it will select for those that are better adapted and stronger. So factors that influence this in a healthcare facility, you have exposure to numerous pathogens, and a lot of them are antibiotic resistant. The patients there are going to have weakened immune systems because they're usually ill patients. You can have compromised hosts with impaired resistance. And then you've got the chain of transmission. Here you transmit the pathogens among staff, patients, and visitors via the activities of the staff, including invasive procedures. This can even be just from traveling from room to room, from patient to patient. So how do we try and control these HAIs or nosocomials? Hand washing, disinfection, aseptic procedures, use of sterile instruments, using protective barriers like gowns and masks against blood and bodily fluids. Sometimes we even have to take further steps in trying to isolate patients. So your public health departments, they range all the way from local on up to worldwide. Your local would be your city and county health departments that are going to report data to the state agency. With the state, state laws govern disease reporting. They will play a role in epidemiological studies and publish a bulletin similar to the MMWR. Nationally, the CDC is one branch. They do research in etiology and prevention. And then we have the World Health Organization, WHO, that's going to coordinate efforts to try and improve public health throughout the world. One of the big things is trying to interrupt transmission, creating standards of cleanliness. So a big one is having potable water, water that's fit to drink. This may occur through filtration or chlorination processes. Sometimes those are not available in some third world countries. Food, there's standards set for canning, preserving, pasteurizing, irradiating, techniques for food handlers to try and make the food sources safe. Vector control, this is going to especially include mosquitoes and rodents, trying to eliminate breeding grounds, use of insecticides, taking personal precautions, washing hands before and during food preparation, disinfecting kitchen surfaces, proper refrigeration and freezing, adequate cooking of meat, so the personal precautions, there are a lot of regulations out there in the food industry for this happening in places that serve food, like restaurants. However, a lot of times these are not necessarily followed at home. A lot of cases of food poisoning people give to themselves at home. And then public health education, educating the public to make healthy choices. This can be difficult, especially when you're trying to control sexual transmission of disease and having people control their habits there, or controlling air transmission.